Welcome back to Economic Outlook. I apologize for the delay between entries, but as you can see, I've relocated, upgraded my equipment, and even founded a new company to house my management and financial strategic consulting activities. I want to pick up where I left off in my last set of entries. Previously, I demonstrated why fuel conservation measures were insufficient to curtail long-term energy demand growth. I used the city of Atlanta as an example of how increasing populations and growing economies continue to increase our demand for fossil fuels. In this entry, I want to explain the urgency behind this situation. True conservation requires change. In my next series of entries, I will explain why Americans need to rethink their views on public transportation, commuting, and the way we design our cities and communities. America has prospered in a time in which energy was cheap, abundant, and easy to obtain. Today, the landscape is different, and most consumers are unaware of the urgency of our current energy situation. Let's look at why. The average American's interaction with the energy industry is limited to paying utility bills or buying gasoline. Most people's experiences begin and end when they pay a market price for electricity, natural gas, or a gasoline bill. Consumers are insulated from the actual workings of the energy industry. While some people may understand that fossil fuels are a finite resource, the energy industry is so adept at meeting demand that the concept of depletion has largely been ignored or forgotten by most American consumers. There is no scarcity of energy in America. Prices rise and fall, but lines at gasoline stations or brownouts in the evenings are exceedingly rare occurrences. Occasionally, a hurricane may disrupt refinery activity, and prices may spike and lines may form at gas stations. Consumers write off these price increases to speculation, big oil profiteering, or price gouging. Eventually, even the most severe price increases seem to return to normal. Given the way most consumers interact with energy markets, it's not surprising that there's little urgency to change our national energy policy. However, forces are at play which threaten to disrupt the global supply and demand for energy. The time for contemplation and planning is quickly running out. President Obama has taken the first step with his fuel economy measures. In this study, I will explain why it's imperative that our country continue to reevaluate its national energy policy. Let's look at the changing global energy marketplace. In the past, countries outside of the United States, Western Europe, and the former Soviet Union had almost non-existent demands for energy, particularly fossil fuels. However, the growth of industrialization in areas like South America, Africa, India, and China have dramatically increased these regions' needs for fossil fuels. Consumers in these countries have observed the standard of living in the West and logically want to enjoy the same comforts. Growing economic prosperity has whetted consumer demands for new automobiles, housing, and consumer products. The effects of globalization have been felt in the West as well. Our spending habits have changed, which have spawned massive industrial manufacturing complexes abroad and focused our economy on services. Americans have adopted the suburban model of commuting and living. These developments would not have been possible without cheap, abundant energy. So far, the world has been able to grow the energy supply necessary to meet demand, particularly in transportation through crude oil. Because of the abilities of a few major suppliers like Saudi Arabia, American consumers have been able to enjoy an increased standard of living while using more and more crude oil, even as global demand increased. Unfortunately, like any fossil fuel, oil is a finite resource. It will eventually be depleted. Just because consumers have been conditioned to believe that producers can meet unlimited demand doesn't make the notion true. Oil production will peak, decline, and eventually lose economic viability. It's not a matter of if, but when this will occur. The lack of awareness among energy consumers is alarming. While this study is far from comprehensive, it will explain some of the challenges we face as our energy demands grow in the face of a potential plateau in supply. The implications are clear. America's standard of living is predicated on cheap oil 
and global economic development assumes a stable supply of cheap energy. The end of cheap oil and cheap energy threatens our standard of living and our general economic prosperity. Now is the time to review the way we live, how we look at our commuting habits, and our opinion of mass transit. The longer we delay making these tough decisions will only increase the social and economic impact of increasing energy prices. To understand why the era of cheap energy may be coming to an end, it's useful to look at the history of oil production in the United States as an example. Domestic oil production began in earnest on January 10, 1901 at Spindletop in Beaumont, Texas. For the next 50 years, exploration and drilling made the U.S. the world's most dominant oil producer. Oil men proclaimed that the bounty was endless. Shell researcher M. King Hubbard's 1956 prediction of future declines in production were casually dismissed. In 1970, the United States produced 3.52 billion barrels of oil. From this point forward, production declined just as Hubbard postulated. Remember, Hubbard made his prediction back in 1956, when production was at 2.5 million billion barrels annually and climbing. The accuracy of his prediction astonished oil executives. As time elapsed and production continued to decline into the 80s and 90s, the concept of peak production turned into a reality. Oil production in the United States has followed a rough bell curve. Hubbard, a trained geologist and physicist, used complex differential equations to model the production of oil based on the quantity of oil already produced or extracted from the ground and the reserves available. Hubbard's mathematics are dense, but there's a useful shortcut which shows us the core philosophy behind Hubbard's depletion model. I first encountered this method when reading a book called Beyond Oil, The View from Hubbard's Peak. Kenneth DeFay, professor emeritus in Princeton, applies a technique common in population biology to oil production and depletion. The concept, now called Hubbard linearization, uses a simplified mathematical process to uncover the key features of the Hubbard curve. All credit for this method belongs to Professor DeFay. I will demonstrate and explain this method as it relates to domestic oil production. Then, we'll try to use this method to extrapolate some ideas about the future of global oil production in our next entry.